As Nicole said, I'm, everyone can hear me okay? I'll try not to get my beard in the mic. Um, I'm the curatorial assistant in charge of mammals, um, as well as reptiles and amphibians. Uh, but today we're going to be focusing on mammals. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about the whole weasel family, and hopefully you'll think they're as cool as I do at the end of it. So, without further ado, um, weasels are way cool because they just are. And now I'm done. No. Um, how else would you describe such a charismatic little animal? Um, little to <coughs> quite large, actually, in the case of the wolverine. Um, they play around. They're social. They <coughs> use tools, one of the only non-primate mammals to do so. They're their own toboggans. They slide around in the snow. Um, and they have numerous pop culture uh, references to them all the time comic book characters, um, cartoon characters, things like that. Um, just a bit of an outline of what I'm going to go over with the talk. So I'm just going to do, do an introduction to the weasels themselves. Um, uh, when I say weasels, it's the whole family of mustelids. I'll get into that, though. Um, their diversity, natural history, breeding, ecology, things like that. Um, every once in a while, I'll be showing you a specimen and maybe getting some feedback about it. Um, but don't feel like you have to participate. I'll just go on if it's too much. Um, so then I'm going to go through some specific weasels, the weasels of the world. Um, can't go through them all. It would be a four-hour talk to mention each one. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about some fossil weasels, so how they were in the past, uh, some of the extremes of in size and how long they've been with us and sort of their biogeography in the past, where they originally came from and things like that. And then at the end, I'm going to go through, um, you saw at the beginning that was a marten in a tree, my little photo essay about me following it through the bush and it getting mad at me. Um, so here we go. Oh, and uh, just a shout out here, it is Groundhog Day. Um, and the real reason that the groundhog goes and hides away for another six weeks of winter is because mustelids don't hibernate and they eat them. Um, so why do I Well, obviously it's the cutest thing in the world to begin with. Um, but they're playful and vicious, amazing. I, I've seen them, uh, little baby ones, playing in uh, my backyard when I was a kid. And they're just crazy. Otters seem to just love life and goof around all the time. Uh, they're found all over the world. They're amazing social animals, um, as well as being solitary tough as nails things like the wolverine and the honey badger. So what is a weasel? Well, if you're in the UK or Europe and you say weasel, it's that. Um, they just call it a weasel. It's the only one that actually has the common name weasel. In North America, we call it the least weasel because we call everything else, like stoats and things, weasels as well. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is the weasel family in general. So they're called Mustelidae. Um, whenever you see a, a word like that that ends in I-D-A-E in animals, that means it's a family name, just in case you ever come across something like that. And this is an older group of toys, and it has a skunk in it. Skunks used to be considered part of the weasels, but are no longer. Um, modern molecular work and things like that have pushed them out into their own group, and actually the closest related other mammal to the mustelids is the raccoons. <clears throat> so as I was talking about the family, it includes a wide variety of the smallest, actually, carnivore, the least weasel down there beside the wolverine, to the wolverine's the largest terrestrial one, but there's uh, another couple that are quite a bit bigger. So that's just those specimens there. And uh, all of those, except for one, is found in BC. Any guesses which one? This one? That one's a wolverine, it is. All the weasels are. Martin is. Fisher. Badger, although it's endangered in BC. The only one in that picture that uh, isn't found in BC is called the Terra, and it's from Central and South America. <coughs> so they're commonly called mustelids, or the weasel family. Um, so what makes up a weasel? So it's this list of little categories, and of course there's exceptions to most of them, except for the five toes on each foot. Everyone has those. 
Um, so it's just like you or me, we got five toes. Um, so they're small to medium carnivores. Um, they're generally elongate and kind of slithery looking. Um, they have short stubby legs, sort of a stocky build to the body. And all but one, there's an exception there, have uh, these pungent anal scent glands, which they use to mark their territory and in some cases as defense, hence the skunk being in the same family for the longest time. There are some weasels, which I'll get to, um, that black and white one down there that are can spray just like a skunk. Um, so any questions about any of those weird guys? Well, we'll all get to that. It's a surprise. <laughs> Uh, the, the black on the bottom and gray on top? Yeah. Uh, so that's a honey badger. It's from Africa and the Middle East and India. I'll talk about that specifically when we get on to it. Um, and then the last characteristic is this funny little molar thing. So because they have such a short snout, uh, in order to fit all the teeth in, this molar sort of turns sideways to scrunch in evolutionarily. <coughs> <laughs> and in some cases, like the sea otter, it's actually a pretty big square molar, and that's because they have to crush up uh, invertebrates and things. Um, I really love old natural history texts, and this one's from 1889 for young people. Um, as you can see, it has the skunk in it. For some reason, the skunk's up a tree. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Striped skunks don't climb trees. If it was a spotted skunk, maybe. But um, So that's just a selection of them and how they were interpreted back in the 1880s. Um, you see the white one there is a ferret, which is actually not a wild species. It's thought to have come from the polecats of uh, Europe and the steppe polecat in Eurasia. Um, so by the numbers, everybody likes to have a, a list of numbers of things and know what the biggest thing is and everything is and how many of them there are. So there's 22 genera um, in the weasels. Um, 56 to 59 species, depending on which reference you use and um, how late in the year it is and how many people are publishing papers, particularly. And in 2008, what was considered a single species of hog badger throughout Eurasia was split into three. So hundreds of years of that, and then molecular work comes about, and they're like, nope, they're all separate. So it constantly changes. Um, they make up a, almost a quarter of all um, the carnivores. Um, so they're the most speciose family in the carnivores. Um, the next largest is the cats with only 37. And just to give you some perspective, sort of a local thing, there's 21 carnivores in BC, and 10 of them are mustelids. Um, I've seen nine of them in the wild, although mostly not in BC. I grew up in rural northern, northwestern Ontario, so we had more options for seeing things in the wild. So the smallest member, as I've already mentioned, is the least weasel, or just the common weasel in Europe. Um, so it's only like that big, and it preys on mice that are that big, <laughs> and it seems to have no problem. It'll even prey on rabbits, um, even though it's so tiny. And it's 25 grams, so it's like nothing when you compare it to other things. Um, so for the largest members of the family, um, it's sort of a tie, because um, if you go by length, it's the giant otter from Brazil, which can be about 205 centimeters maximum. It's the full length of it, um, which is about halfway between Darth Vader's and Chewbacca's height. <laughs> um, and about the same height as LeBron James for basketball fans. Um, the heaviest is the sea otter, which is also quite big, about the same height as Princess Leia. Um, and it weighs about 45 kilograms or just under 100 pounds or so. Um, so probably bigger than, and that's, they don't get that big anymore, but um, usually on BC, but uh, in California they do. <coughs> so, which do you think has the strongest bite, speaking of numbers? Now, obviously it's going to be the wolverine just from pure number of it, because it'll be able to crush something so much bigger and it's so much huger, but if you um, make it with body mass as a factor, then the strongest bite uh, in the animal kingdom is actually the least weasel. So it's so tiny and it can go through the skull of a rabbit, no problem. So it's about 400 PSI for the wolverine and uh, something like 100 PSI for the, the little tiny weasel, which when it's 100 times bigger, it factors out quite differently. 
Um, so that's all those skulls that are laid out there. Um, the way these are laid out is uh, females on the top and males on the bottom, so you get into the uh, sexual dimorphism in, in uh, the weasels. Um, it's really apparent in the fisher skull, which is that one right there. The male has a huge sagittal crest, so it has stronger jaw muscles, and uh, the female is quite a bit smaller. Um, so some interesting all-encompassing mustelid behaviors and characteristics. Um, they can be a little bit pregnant, which seems <laughs> like a kind of a weird thing, but it's true. So they, um, they have a fertilized embryo and it just sort of floats around in the uterus for up to 11 months. Some, some of them is shorter, some of them is longer. And that's so um, they mate in the summer or in the fall when they can find mates easily and then they delay the implantation and the <coughs> growth of the baby weasel until uh, conditions are better so it can have better food. Um, and uh, it's fairly common in uh, mustelids, about a third of them have this ability. And uh, in the rest of the mammals, it's only about 0.05% that that actually happens. There's like one deer that does it and a couple mice and things like that. It's kind of weird. Um, they have huge home ranges, um, especially the solitary ones like the honey badger or the wolverine here. So 2127 is the largest uh, male um, <coughs> range that they found, and that was in Alaska. And to give you some perspective, that's about the same size as the entire lower mainland, and that's one male's territory. So it patrols the whole thing, overlaps with females, and uh, it seems they seem to be able to run f about 40 kilometers in a day without slowing down. They've, they've tracked them, um, just their trackway is just a, this continuous lope. To, and they can just walk forever, hence the uh, huge amount of stamina, and the, they don't seem to have any fatigue or take a rest until the end of the day or whenever they're traveling. It's just am amazing, in my opinion. I can't even run 10K and <laughs> falling over. <coughs> now, to get in, I didn't show any pictures here because it's kind of gross. Um, the darker weaselly side of weasels. So the whole weasel term, where it's somebody sneaky or something like that, comes from the weasel rather than it being a name given to the weasel because they were sneaky. It sort of reverses what you would think. So a lot of the mustelids have sort of this insatiable need to kill things. <laughs> um, there's been recorded things with otters where they've wiped out entire bird colonies just, and they don't even eat them. Um, but um, things like the least weasel and the smaller weasels will go into a mouse nest and kill everything and then go cache it. Um, so they do eventually eat it, it's just... Um, and then mating isn't particularly pleasant for the female. They get bit on the neck and it's particularly hard on um, mink farms and things like that, um, where the female has nowhere to go and there's uh, some can be deaths of the female and that sort of thing. And uh, females tend to have thicker skin on the back of their necks because that's sort of thing. Um, but on a lighter note, they're notoriously clever and somehow get into things which makes killing everything a real problem for livestock and things like that. But it made for domesticating the polecat into the ferret and a fun pet nowadays, but uh, in medieval times and things, people would go on and on with baskets of ferret and you'd pay the guy and he'd go into your barn and eliminate all the rats in a few hours because they just go crazy. Any questions so far? So here's a nice complicated uh, tree of all the mammals. And it's just to give you an idea of where the mustelids fit in, the blue arrow there. Um, and. Uh, this is a neat, there's lots of information on this diagram. You don't have to memorize it or anything, but uh, you can see where they relate to everything else. And, uh, the carnivores sort of branched off from uh, about 50, 60 million years ago. And another super complicated cladogram, I really like them, but I'm a weird scientist, so. Um, this one has colors and all sorts of fun. So the red is uh, species that are found in the old world and the blue is new world species. Um, until recently, there were two subfamilies, only two of this very diverse uh, group of animals. Um, there were otters and everything else. Um, modern molecular techniques, however, have divided them up into eight different subfamilies. 
Um, and you can see the common names on the side, and I'll get to a more simplified version of that. Um, I have some fake weasels here. So it looks a lot like a weasel in the weasel family. This is actually a mongoose. And just to add confusion, this is an otter civet. So even though it's named for the mustelids, it's uh, not even closely related. And this is a palm civet. So all of these are more closely related to cats, um, whereas the weasels are closely related to dogs. So there's two major groups of carnivores, um, the feliforms and the caniforms, so dogs and cats. So even the whole carnivora is divided up into cat people and dog people. <laughs> um, all the different colors here uh, sort of hint at the complicated history of uh, mustelids moving around the world. So they've colonized North America multiple times, whether it's by rafts, otters coming across from Africa and things like that. Um, and it's constantly changing. Every time they find a new fossil, they put it into a new program to make a new tree and it comes out in a weird place. So it just, like I said, constantly changes, especially with such a large group of carnivores. Um, and here's the, the less complicated tree, so you just get the common names. And I've sort of just listed the, the subfamilies and what it includes. I won't go through them. If you want to come down and look at them later, it's fine. We have most of them in the collection, the, the weird striped weasels and things we don't. <clears throat> so a bit about uh, the range. As I said, they're found all over the world. So the map in the background is a, sort of a heat map of uh, the hotspots of diversity. So the darker blue is where there's more diversity of, and more numbers of uh, mustelids. <clears throat> so a bit about the ecology. Um, being carnivores, they eat mostly animals, anything from insects to moose. Usually it's um, eating a moose as carrion, but there are a few documented cases of wolverines taking on a full-grown moose. And um, in BC, there's for sure a couple instances of one tracking and uh, hunting, taking down when it finally wore out a uh, full-size male mountain caribou. And what are they preyed upon by? Um, a lot of birds of prey, so owls and hawks and things, although uh, occasionally um, there's records of martins and things going after owls and uh, goshawks, maybe some retribution or something. Um, there's a, I read a good story about a martin that stalked a uh, northern goshawk, which is a, a big hawk and big enough to take a full-size martin. It stalked it for a few hours before it actually caught it and ate it. <coughs> um, sharks and killer whales, they mostly go after sea otters and uh, marine otters and occasionally the, you'll see the northern river otters out in the ocean. So it's not a significant amount of predation, but sharks and killer whales are kind of cool too. So. Um, and then otters in South America and in Africa have to deal with crocodilians on occasion. Although there are cases of uh, cooperative um, giant otters taking on caimans in South America. <clears throat> and then, of course, the larger carnivores, mammalian carnivore, as in the order of carnivora in um, the mammals. They, uh, they hunt them, too, um, although it seems that uh, other than bears, uh, things like cats and things don't tend to eat them. They just sort of, and wolves, um, they'll eat a little bit, but apparently they don't taste very good, which is not the case other mustelids. Other mustelids have no problem eating other mustelids, even if they're the same species. Um, apparently that the scent really doesn't throw them off. And then the biggest predator is us, um, directly trapping and uh, also habitat loss and uh, problem animals and things like uh, badgers digging holes and farmers killing them because they don't want them destroying their fields and things like that. Um, they're found in pretty much every environment on the planet, um, from deserts, jungles, forests, um, all over the place. Um, and it's a nearly worldwide distribution. Um, the white areas are where they're not found. So in Australia, New Zealand, Madagascar, there's a little bit in uh, Greenland, but not in Iceland, um, and Antarctica. Um, although the, now there are stoats and weasels in New Zealand because they were introduced. 
So now I'm going to go through some specific examples of different weasels, the ones that I thought were the coolest and uh, have the most interesting uh, behaviors. So that's the North American otter, also called the Northern River otter, or just the river otter. Um, that picture was taken by my wife in Ukulet. He played and chewed on ropes for quite a while. That's just a stock photo. Um, and their otters in general are pretty fun. They, as I said, they have a built-in toboggan, and they are pretty amazing when they're sliding around. They can get lots of distance. And actually, just on the flat, they sort of bound, bound, slide, bound, bound, slide. And you can see their tracks like that. Um, they're some of the largest of the weasel family. Um, they're mostly fish eaters, piscivores. Although, like all of the weasels, they're opportunistic and will eat pretty much anything. Nothing safe from them: invertebrates, ducklings, eggs, turtles, and even beavers and muskrats. Um, they're usually found near water, but they will travel like between in like southern Saskatchewan, and if there's a huge distance between two rivers, they'll travel a few hundred kilometers to get to them. And uh, in winter, if they're looking for open water, they have to go find it in certain rivers and things like that. And like I said, they slide on their bellies. I've seen the tracks in the mud, and I've seen them sliding on the snow. But... And everybody knows this cute little guy. Um, that was actually a picture taken by me off the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. Um, a little baby fuzzball there. So that's the biggest one. And it's also the only one that doesn't have the anal glands. So because it's fully aquatic or almost fully aquatic, they give birth in the ocean. The only time they come ashore is when it's really stormy or if they're sick or injured. Um, so there's no real need for anal glands. It would just make a bunch of smell in the water that might attract a shark or something like those. Um, people probably already know this, but uh, they have the densest fur of any mammal, 100,000 per square centimeter, so a little bit, which is as much as people have on their head. I probably have a bit more. But, um, they have neat little pockets under their arms so they can carry, they can dive down, stuff an urchin in there and stuff their favorite rock in there, and then come up to the top. And they're only non-primate mammal to use tools, although they're get to another one that might. Um, so they have their favorite rock that they smash uh, urchins or clams on. Um, and there's a documented case of them in Monterey Bay, California, of uh, collecting cans off the bottom because little baby octopus like to hide in containers like that. So, and then they'll put them back down on the ground and wait for them and uh, the next day come down and pop another octopus out of it. So that's actually how they uh, fish for octopus in the Mediterranean. They have lines of pots. So it's a similar thing. <coughs> Plus they're really cute. Um, so this guy is the stoat or ermine or short-tailed weasel. Uh, ermine usually refers to it when it has a white coat. So that's uh, in the wintertime. Northern ranges, both it, the least weasel, and the long-tailed weasel change to white um, the stoat and the long-tailed weasel maintain a little black dot on the tip of their tail which is thought to help them avoid predators because the predator goes slightly more for the tail and it's far enough away so that the owl or the hawk will miss and that gives them a bit of an advantage. The least weasel because its tail is only like that long um, it doesn't have the black dot because it wouldn't help it very much. Um, like I was saying they're big enough to uh, overpower a full-size European rabbit, which can be 10 times their weight. Um, and there's actually two uh, BBC documentaries of David at Attenborough where he uh, has a full chase scene. So Life of Mammals from 2003 and Life from 2011, they both have variations on that. It's kind of brutal, but um, cool that it can just run down the, the rabbit. The rabbit's way faster than it at the beginning, but it just keeps going and bounding. It's like the tortoise and the hare kind of thing. <coughs> Um, and these are the skunk-like ones. They can spray. Um, they're in Africa and Asia. Um, they have a cool name, the Zorilla. Um, that one up there. <coughs> and uh, they certainly look like skunks and act like skunks, but they're not skunks. Now, for my favorite group is the Martins and Fishers, which the Wolverine is also a part of, but I'll treat that separately. 
Um, so both of these guys depend on uh, not necessarily old growth, but at least mature growth forests. And they're semi-arboreal, so they run through the trees to catch things. Uh, martins usually go after birds and red squirrels and things. Um, and fishers go after those as well as martins. Okay. And they are, even though they're quite a bit bigger, they're quite a bit faster in the trees. <coughs> um, fishers also have a renowned ability to one of the few things that seek out and hunt porcupines. You can see from his face there, he's had a little bit of a run-in with one. It's, uh, it takes a long time. They uh, basically run around in circles and bite its face until it's subdued and uh, then move in. And then it's a meal for a week for them because it's just so much bigger. Um, and they also have a neat uh, back feet that can turn them around sideways, the joints and their ankles. and. Uh, they can climb down so they can force porcupines go up trees all the time so they can force them to yeah. uh, fit. Oh, yeah, he. <laughs> oh, and as a side note, uh, a group of Martin is called a richness. Oops, sorry, wrong Wolverine. Um, uh, this is the real Wolverine. Um, it doesn't have adamantium claws or super mutant healing, although it probably heals fairly well. Um, but it does have super senses. It has a great nose. It's a scavenger, so it has to be able to sense uh, dead things from a long ways away. They're not exactly sure how far, but um, it has some amazing legends associated with it, scaring off bears and things. They're probably somewhat exaggerated, uh, although there are documented cases of it happening on occasion. And uh, they're called gluttons. Their Latin name, gullo gullo, actually means glutton glutton. So. Um, but they don't eat anything really more than a, a normal carnivore would do. Um, a lot of carnivores just eat a ton to begin with, and because they're especially if they're at a scavenged kill. <coughs> um, they are amazing creatures in how far they go, an average of 40 kilometers a day with no problem. Um, and modern telemetry has uh, had them climb just straight over the tallest peak in Glacier National Park, just straight over the top. Just, I'm going to go this way and nothing's going to stop me. Um, and as I mentioned before, they have a 400 PSI pounds per square inch uh, bite and are able to take down full-grown mountain caribou. And uh, uh, people of the north love them because they have this innate ability. It, it's not that frost doesn't form on it. It's just if you bump it, everything will fall off. So they're good for lining parka head hoods. Um, the Eurasian badger is pretty neat because uh, it's a, a seat of badgers uh, that live in a set. So I don't know if that's where that comes from. And they, they're sort of communal, so they can uh, up to 29 individuals, although usually it's just four or five of the same clan. Um, they mostly eat earthworms, although when I was in Scotland, they liked to eat peanuts and um, jam duck toast um, <laughs> in the backyard. We didn't actually see them because they were coming out late at night. It was cold when we were there. Um, but the cabin we were staying in, they, there'd be tracks, and all the peanuts would be gone every morning. Um, <coughs> They're pretty omnivorous as uh, mustelids go. They'll eat pretty much anything, kind of like a little bear. Um, I mentioned the, the TB. Um, so they have they, they're carriers of uh, bovine tuberculosis in the UK, and there's a controversial cull of them going on, um, but it's unclear as to whether it's worthwhile because it doesn't really reduce the prevalence of TB in them. You basically have to eliminate them all. But won't want to suggest that. Um, so it's not really any point to it. They're calling it, but it doesn't affect the prevalence of TV. And this guy, you may have seen that meme in 2011. There's a whole video about him. He just doesn't care. Gets bit in the face by a cobra and wakes up a little while later and eats the cobra. Um, they actually have a huge resistance to, I have a skull of one over there. Later, um, to uh, any type of venom, bees, snakes, anything, and their skin is all 
really thick and loose on them, so it prevents uh, bites from going through. Um, there's probably, like the Wolverine, a bit too much of legends involved in describing them, but uh, there has been documented cases of them using a tool if rolling a log somewhere so that you can stand on it and then reach up and grab a big bird to eat is using a tool, and I'll go with that. Um, they just, they're just they amazing diggers. They can dig into hard packed ground and totally submerge themselves in the dirt in less than 10 minutes. I couldn't do that with a shovel, especially not hard packed ground. I'd have to get a backhoe to do it. And they're quite formidable, stand up to lions and things like that, although they are preyed upon by lions. And the last one that I'm going to do is the most primitive of the mustelids. So it came over from Eurasia probably about 30 million years ago to North America. Um, it's most primitive and it was the first branch off the tree of uh, the mustelids. Um, they're pretty neat. I've seen them in Saskatchewan. They look like a, a floating carpet mat, funny colored hair because you can't see their legs and their hair kind of splays out in a flat. Um, they are in British Columbia, but they're pretty rare. Um, they too are great diggers and they go after um, voles and things that are underground. And they partner up with coyotes, and it's unclear whether there's actual benefit for the badger. There's a benefit for the coyote because as it's digging down, it scares away things for the coyote to eat. But it's not clear whether the coyote keeps things underground so that the badger also gets more things. Now we're going to move on to some fossil mustelids. So down in the corner is a reconstruction. It just looks like somebody put longer legs on the CG version of a wolverine. <laughs> of Echorus, that's the genus name. Um, it was about the size of a leopard or jaguar. Um, in the fossil record, there's about 84 genera and about a few hundred species um, that they found. Um, and these are two of the biggest ones. Um, if you look at that scale bar on the skull, so that's just the nose of it, um, that's 10 centimeters. So if you compare it to our modern otter, that's about 10 centimeters there, so its entire head skull could fit in the front portion of that mouth, so it was about three or four times the size of it, so bigger than me. Um, just a note about fossil preservation in mustelids. Um, I like paleontology, so this kind of stuff is, makes mustelids even more interesting. Uh, they have really rare fossils mostly because of where they live. There's not really a preservation potential. So if they live in the forest, they're just going to decompose and get eaten by other things and not uh, show up as fossils. So many of the fossils that you get are a little fragment that's about two centimeters long. And somehow you get a new species out of that. I'm not an expert enough to figure that out. Uh, I can tell it's a mustelid, but that's about as far as I could go. Um, another complicated cladogram, which I again love. This one is uh, using fossil um, fossils as well to tease out the relationships between everything. Uh, for a long time, this guy at the bottom, it was an argument between whether it was a seal or an otter, but in this analysis it clearly comes out in the mustelids. Um, just a bit about their paleogeography. So this is the, they originated in A and then spread out through most of the world um, multiple times to North America. And it's just an interesting geography of uh, how they spread and just continually spread different ice ages. So it was 30 million years ago that the badgers first came to North America, and probably 11,000 years ago that the most recent immigrant, they think that the coastal form of the American Martin actually came from uh, Asia over the Bering um, Strait. And it, it's found from Alaska down to California. It's, there's kind of an argument whether it's a that should be a separate species or not. Um, if you're interested, I can show you the difference in size of the skulls and things, but um, I find it fascinating. Um, and the reason behind all this radiation is probably because they eat rodents. Um, so rodents suddenly exploded on the scene about 20 million years ago, and so did mustelids. And then there was a huge radiation of a bunch of the mustelids, all the modern forms, and that's why you get so many. It corresponded to the same time when rats and bulls and everything suddenly proliferated around the world. So um, that coupled with some climate changes uh, through glaciation and things probably resulted in the vastly more diverse uh, mustelids than any other of the carnivores. 
So that's it for my sciencey part. And there's the Martin. He just missed a red squirrel. Um, there was a red squirrel at our feeder on the deck, and uh, he just missed it, and uh, it escaped. And then I ran outside and tried to find him everywhere, and the squirrel told me where he was. The squirrel was chattering and watching him from a tree about 100 feet away from him. And, uh, and I took a whole series of photos, and he got getting more and more agitated, growling, hiding, going to go change trees and <laughs> jump. <laughs> now I'm on this tree, and he's still there watching me. Stop taking my picture. <laughs> I'm getting really mad. He was grunting at this time. Um, <laughs> and then he posed for one more picture and then took off the forest. So this was me on the weekend writing the talk yesterday. <laughs> um, weasels ripped my flesh. I actually read that, uh, that article. It's from 1956, uh, Man's Life. Um, it's kind of interesting. It's about this guy who's guarding his duck hut and, uh, with a shotgun. And uh, it was just after, he was in Connecticut. It was just after a hurricane had come through, so they didn't have power back in, I think it was 53. And so he was guarding it because something kept killing a whole bunch of ducks. And, it, and uh, then he was falling asleep with the shotgun on his lap. And then he saw the weasels in the rafters and he shot one and then a bunch of them attacked his feet. I don't know how true it is. This is just what I read. Um, and the, the, the gas lamp fell on the ground, lit the ducks on fire and the shed on fire, and then he fell out into the creek and there was weasels everywhere. And the, apparently... I don't know. <laughs> um, I'd like to acknowledge the BD for letting me use these. David Nagorson is a great vomologist. He turned me on to mustelids four or five years ago as uh, possible research projects and things like that. Jenny Ellis, my wife. Uh, Karen Needham, who always has lots of info for me. And uh, then my TA and two professors from my paleontology class that uh, I built this lecture on. And then this is an osprey fighting with an otter in honor of the Seahawks fighting the Broncos <laughs> in a couple hours. <laughs>